Hello BookTube, it's Saturday and it's time for another installment of Book to Film. And this week uh, is the book Some Must Watch by Ethel Lynn, or sorry, Ethel Lena White and the Robert C. Odmack directed Spiral Staircase uh, from 1946 starring uh, Dorothy McGuire, oh, there's a lot of glare there, sorry. Uh, Dorothy McGuire, George Brent, Ethel Barrymore, Elsa Lanchester, uh, Rhonda Fleming, um, just a, a fabulous cast. Uh, but uh, let's get to the book. It's a 1933 book. Uh, it's sort of a, a, a suspense uh, murder type book. And it's basically about... Uh, well, the main character is a Helen Capel. Uh, she's working, she's a young uh, woman working as a maid in a very um, sort of remote house uh, in, I believe it's, it's, it could be Wales, I think it is. I don't think it's actually said, but I've come across references saying that it's Wales. Uh, and uh, she says she's 23 but she's actually younger. Uh, I, I, I believe that she's like probably 19. Her parents had uh, died and she's been sort of taking care of herself since she was 14. Um, she's, she's described as tiny. Um, so don't know. They don't, they don't give her a height or anything like that, but I'm, I'm sort of envisioning in my mind, uh, like somebody, uh, a woman, five foot, uh, tall ish, um, or even shorter, uh, and she has uh, flaming red hair, uh, is another distinguishing mark. And she's in this house. Um, uh, there's a name for the house, and I've forgotten the name. Oh, oh well, it's it's not important. But there's there's a name of the house, and uh, there is uh, Professor Professor Warren. Uh, who is uh, who is the son of uh, a woman, uh, well, Lady Lady Warren, uh, and um, his father built the house, and she's now, uh, his mother, Lady Warren, has come back home, and she's bedridden. Um, there's a history to her. She's, uh, she's possibly shot her husband, um, and it's it's not it's not all that uh well it, it yeah she shot her husband um she killed him uh but she got off on that and she left the house she left and uh her son sort of eventually took it over and she has a uh sort of uh stepdaughter as well uh named blanche um and um professor warren has a son who's married uh, and and him and his wife live there as well. And there's also a student called Stephen. And uh, there are two servants. There's uh, a maid, Mrs. Oates, and Mr. Oates is a sort of handyman. And the sort of setup is that uh, uh, Helen is is quite new to the position. Um, she's 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 young, uh, but she's not altogether naive she's she's sharp as attack but also um prone to a, a big imagination uh jumps to conclusions a bit uh and i like the way um ethel lena white uh does uh like her character she she's thinking in her head a lot of times so there's an internal dialogue that she has about a lot of things and you know how it is when you read something and you come across a character every so often that you really, really like. You really like. And this is this is a character that I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and I really, really liked her because she's she's uh, even though she's young, she she uh, she she snaps back at things when people say something, you know, sort of nasty to her and stuff like that. She speaks up. Unlike most servants would, uh, it's it is contemporary. It's a 1933 book, so it is roughly around that time. And because the house is so remote, 
uh, it's hard to get people to stay. So maybe that's why they would be more lenient with her. But she also eats her meals with the family, which is very unlike a lot of time servants. Uh, there's a there's a nurse. Well, there's there's a nurse that shows up, but there's a previous nurse that takes care of Lady Warren, uh, and Lady Warren is a bit doolally. <laughs> Uh, she's a bit crazy. She started uh, uh, like there was uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, maids, uh, the maid that was before Helen. Um, he she got her to dust underneath the bed and then started bashing her with her cane or something uh, because she said her feet smelled and she stunk. So she left, and uh, the nurse that was there to take care of her. Uh, I forget what she threw at her. I think it might have been a, a, a hot water bottle, uh, like uh, the ceramic hot water bottle, and threw it at her and pinged her right in the head. So they had to get a new uh, 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 nurse, and they got sort of a very Martinette-type uh, nurse uh, that uh, nobody seems to like. Uh, she's very... Uh, uh, well, they, they describe her as sort of mannish. Uh, she's very, she's, they, they think, uh, the, the uh, Mrs. Oates thinks that she could be a man. But while this is all going on, this internal strife in the house, and the other thing that sort of, there's a bit of a soap opera going on that uh, Professor Warren's son's wife uh, is in love with the student that's there and she's openly it's very clear and open that she's in love with the student right in front of her husband but he doesn't really want to have anything to do with her but her husband is very very clingy uh very uh uh you know uh jealous uh, but yeah all this is sort of going on but outside of this uh there's been several murders of women young women um and uh, they sort of were getting closer to the house. And uh, there's a doctor, Dr. Perry, who's taking care of Lady Warren. Um, he's, he's there uh, because she sort of uh, is his nightly visit. Uh, but then he gets called out uh, to uh, somebody from the, the local pub. Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, there's another, there's another murder, and it turns out to be the, the young woman that was the servant, um, the before, or the maid before Helen, um, uh, and they find that the only, there is a, uh, the only clue is, like, she'd bitten off part, or like a tassel, by the sounds of it, of a, of a scarf, uh, that was still in her mouth, so, uh, and, and while this is going on, this is like, it, it happens like an overnight basically thing, uh, where, uh, it's, it's a stormy night. It's a dark old house. There is electricity cause there is a generator for electricity. This is the 1930s. It's like early thirties. Uh, and as I say, Helen, uh, you know, at the beginning of the book was that day it was her afternoon off. So she, she went for a long walk, but she got a little scared because she realized she went too far and it was going to get dark. So she was rushing back to the house. Uh, and while she was, it was just becoming dusk when she was approaching the house and she was sure she saw someone behind a tree or while well, she thought it was a tree, but then it moved. Uh, so she was a bit scared, but she rushed in and uh but definitely after the 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 murder of the previous maid um was found um the uh the professor warren tells everyone well we're locking everything up here every every window is going to be locked nobody can go out uh, overnight and nobody can come in um and that's you know, but prior to that, just just prior to that, they needed some oxygen for Lady Warren. Uh, the cylinder had run out, so um, she had just sort of the the uh, the nurse had just come, and um, and says that she you know they need they need uh, some more oxygen. Uh, so Oates, Mister Oates, is sent a long ways. This is sort of now sort of later at night, a uh, long ways to to pick up this oxygen. So he's, he's out of the picture. He's going to be a long time, uh, coming back. They don't expect him back till sort of 
uh, well after midnight. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 and, and the whole story is that the numbers dwindle, uh, especially with the men. There's uh, Stephen, who's the student, who decides to leave. Um, uh, there's two reasons for that. Like, he, he gets a dog, and uh, Professor Warren's half-sister, Blanche, doesn't like dogs. She's afraid of dogs, uh, and he's just tired of of um, uh, the uh, Professor Warren's daughter-in-law after him all the time. So he just wants to leave. So he leaves. <laughs> he leaves. So there's another one down. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the meantime, they, uh, the, the Mrs. Oates pour, purloins a bottle of brandy, um, from the cellar, uh, when, uh, when Professor Warren goes down with her to, uh, to, to get a bottle of brandy to, uh, in, in lieu of having, um, the oxygen as a stimulant for Lady Warren. But basically, the the nurse wants a tipple, uh, part of it. But uh, Mrs. Oates uh, purloins a bottle, and she drinks half of it, so she's pretty well senseless. And she winds up being senseless and, you know, possibly drugged, but that's never really filled out. Uh, but she just, you know, winds up drinking pretty well the whole bottle of brandy, so she passes out. Uh, Blanche, who decides to lock herself in her room... Uh, you know, puts cotton wool in her ear and there's a storm raging outside. So she's dead to the world. Professor Warren, uh, has been worried a lot of times. He, he, uh, he winds up, you know, he, he takes, uh, some sleeping drafts and stuff. So he, he's conked out in his chair. Uh, or is he? Mm, that's the question. Uh, but meanwhile, then, then basically Helen is by herself with the nurse and she's scared of the nurse, and she's scared of the old woman, um, Lady Warren, because she seems a bit doolally, and, uh, you know, at one point saying that she wants Helen to be with her, and the other point saying for her to get out and stuff, and she's very harsh, so Helen's quite scared of her. And, you know, the doctor is, is called away as well, um, and she, you know, uh, she calls him up a couple times and because she's very scared because everybody is sort of gone. Um, like, you know, uh, Mrs. Oates is supposed to protect her. Uh, Mr. Oates told her uh, to protect Helen, you know, keep an eye on her. But now she's out and everybody's sort of out of the picture. And then um, she jumps to conclusions about the nurse several times. And the nurse says she's going to leave. Uh, but she leaves all her suitcase and stuff, but then Helen finds out that um, um, the uh, the nurse has been sort of knocked out and tied up, uh, and the, well, I'm going to give away the spoiler to the end, so if you don't want the spoiler of the ending of this, uh, then you might want to just sort of skip ahead a few minutes, uh, but anyway, uh, it's actually, the murderer is actually Professor Warren, uh, who sort of inherited this um, disease from her, uh, from his father, who he watched a murder when he was a child. Uh, his father murdered uh, several other women, so and he started up again. And um, um, Lady Warren sort of n knew sort of this, and but she she says she had something unfinished to do, and she's got a revolver, so she winds up um, saving Helen and killing. Um, killing your own son um, because he's in the moment of killing Helen. So it, that, that's sort of where it ends. Um, but I, I just I just loved it. It's it's a bit you know there's there's twists and turns. Like you know it, it's not difficult to figure out who the bad guy is or the bad person is. Uh, you know uh, they they sort of potentially finger several people but as they sort of disappear and you go no and then you realize that you know the one that's least likely who's drugged and unconscious is the is the uh, is the bad guy and that's what it was so it sort of ends happily she survived she's in love with the doctor and they you know I, I guess happily live happily ever after then we come to the film um, by Robert Siodmak uh, directed 
and uh, I've got some notes here because I'm not going to remember all this. Uh, the script was done by Mel Dinelli. It was his first uh, script. Uh, he also we we met him uh, uh, with the uh, Fritz Lang's House by the River. He did the script for for that as well. And he, and and again, there's changes made. The script uh, of of that was changed from England, I believe, and then you know um, to to uh southern sort of gothic type thing and uh you know just turn of the century and so is this one it's moved from england or wales to to new england and it is again uh it's it set in like it, i keep seeing uh in like 1906 but i'm not sure where that date exactly comes from but it's around that time uh it's it's around the turn of the century uh, and there's no electricity in the house. It's it's uh, candles uh, and gas gas lighting. So it's like a gaslight melodrama melodrama. Uh, and it's and it's just the, the the cinematography and lighting is just fabulous. And that was done by uh, Nicholas uh, Musaraka, I think is the pronunciation. Uh, and I was uh, Italian born, uh, but he came to Hollywood and he basically worked at RKO. It's an RKO picture. Uh, Robert C. Odmack was lent over from uh, from Universal to do this film. Um, and uh, and uh, Musaraka uh, was basically at RKO all the time. And he sort of, he, and, and in many ways, he's developed the film noir uh, look because this is a film noir book, uh, film noir film as well with lots of shadows, uh, non it's unrealistic lighting, but that's what makes it really, really neat. Uh, and that's, that's what he excelled in. And, uh, like I've heard before, and it was mentioned in the uh, commentary, uh, by, uh, Imogene, uh, Sarah Smith, fabulous commentary on here, uh, which is unlike this is a Kino, uh, film. And, uh, lately I haven't been happy with the, uh, with the commentaries that Kino has been doing but this is this one was was well done and she mentions the fact that like directors people say if you can see the directing you can see that happening that it's a bad film but film noir takes that on its on its head and you can see the unrealistic lighting and it's for mood and everything so they also got the gothic sense to it uh, with all that they also changed like they, they cut out characters as they usually do uh blanche uh, the sister-in-law of Professor Warren becomes Blanche, secretary to Professor Warren. And Stephen, the student in the book, becomes the stepbrother. Yeah, stepbrother of, of Professor Warren, who is the stepson of Lady Warren. So Stephen is actually uh, Lady Warren's real son. But he's come back home. Helen is starting to work there. And Helen is mute uh, played by Dorothy McGuire, um, and uh, Rhonda Fleming was playing uh, Blanche, the secretary. Uh, George Brent is Professor Warren. Um, uh, Ethel Barrymore, fabulous actress, uh, is Lady Lady Warren, uh, bedridden, more or less bedridden. Um, and Elsa Lanchester is is Mrs. Oates, the cook, uh, fabulous actress. While well, most people know her from uh, um, uh, as, as the bride of Frankenstein, but that was sort of, you know, no real acting, uh, you know, uh, stretch there, but she was a fabulous character actor, uh, wife to, uh, Charles Lawton. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, getting back to the character of Helen, she's mute in the film. And I just, I like, you know, when they make these changes, okay, I can understand changes of, of, uh, you know, numbers of characters, stuff like that, because, yeah, because it's an easy way to save some money um, and, you know, less actors and all that. I can understand, but why change it from mute, from talking to mute? And I and I kept wondering why. And uh, uh, in the in um, this Imogene, uh, Sarah Smith, she she proposes a couple of things that make perfect sense to me now. Uh, because it makes it more suspenseful that you got a heroine that cannot scream. That is that that is kind of neat, uh, but also too this is nineteen forty six, 
and uh, the the uh, the the reason, f and and they also changed it that the women that have been killed up to that point uh, have been have had um, have had um, uh, infirmities. Um, like the first one that's that's killed is a woman that limped. Um, she had some kind of walking infirmity, uh, and uh, he's hiding in the uh, uh, the killer is hiding in the um, in the uh, in the closet, and all you see is like an eyeball, and you you focus in on the eyeball, and then you see sort of like as if it's a uh, a reflection, a blurred reflection of the woman getting dressed, and then he strangles her, and there's her hand. All you see is sort of her hands up in the air doing a cross thing and, and, and clenching. Uh, and then when the second woman, Rhonda Fleming's character, Blanche, is killed, she's also doing a cross thing, but her arms are outstretched, but there's something black in between, like you can't see anything. All you see, the blackness is the upright of the cross, and then the hands are the sides. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, very effective. It's very neat. Um, and the, the murderer says at the thing that you know oh it's imperfection uh is is sort of you know the I lameness and her ability not to speak it's imperfection and it should be only perfection in life so he wants to uh, kill her and imogene sarah smith proposes that because uh robert siodmak uh fled germany uh from hitler uh and the nazis uh in the early 30s um that he uh, uh, he put this in because of the Nazis, the extermination of uh, imperfection, which which sort of all makes sense, but there's no sort of real evidence if that's where it, where it all came from because there is possible evidence that the script was already written for the most part uh, uh, by the time he was assigned to or started doing the film because it originally was bought the the rights to the book was bought by david o selznick who re originally wanted uh ingrid bergman to play the part not sure if that would have worked out as well but uh she could have done it really well um and then it then it sort of uh it it, it somehow got to rko uh to, sold it to rko and then kurt uh, uh robert siodmak did it but as i say he was uh uh, fled from Nazi Germany um, just after his brother Kurt Siodmak, which was a uh, which was an author. He was a writer, uh, but they they had worked together with Billy Wilder, uh, with Edgar Almer, uh, and with several others on a fabulous sort of uh, sort of semi documentary uh, film in some ways um, called People on Sunday, a German German film from nineteen twenty eight or twenty nine. I was trying to find my copy of it, but I just I could I couldn't locate it just quickly, so I just left it. Uh, but yeah, and uh, it's just you know, like I say, they, they got rid of some of the characters uh, uh, because there's there's no longer uh, the son and the daughter. Uh, there's the brothers that uh, there's the conflict there and. Uh, that could be because there was a bit of conflict between Kurt Siodmak and Robert Siodmak. So it, it, it was a reoccurring theme in Robert Siodmak's uh, films where there's sibling rivalry. Um, but yeah, no, it's just, yeah, the lighting is just fabulous. Uh, and uh, uh, Dorothy McGuire's uh, acting is, is fabulous because she only says a few words at the end. Like she says, I think... Uh, a number, a uh, number like one eight nine, uh, on the phone, and she says, "Doctor Perry, uh, please come. It is I, Helen." <laughs> and that's the only word she says in the whole film, and that's right at the end. Um, and it begins, uh, kind of interestingly. It begins. Uh, the film begins with, uh. Helen's out rather than doing this the walk that she does uh you know away she's in town watching a film she's in a sort of makeshift uh cinema and it's a crank silent cinema 
and they're playing like the sign says the kiss and i thought oh yeah it's the edison kiss and in the uh the uh a commentator says it too that it's confused people but when i started seeing the film i think what no that looks like a dw griffith film but i couldn't figure out which what it was but it is a dw griffith film i was correct that way and she identifies it as the sands of d from 1912 it's anachronistic because if the film's, you know, supposed to be done uh, set before that, but I don't think there's any specific date, but I believe it is set in the first decade. So it's a bit anachronistic, but it's a nice little nudge uh, to sort of uh, uh, and wink, wink in a sense to a Robert C. Oddmax, uh, you know, silent film past. And they got the piano woman, woman piano playing piano for, for this. And then the you know that's when happens like above the uh, uh the little theater, uh the little cinema is where the first murder that it, on screen is showing, uh and uh, another little un un um, credited person is I think well she's the wife or uh or a maid of the hotel where this is all set, uh is um is is uh her name now sorry my my brain just sort of sometimes just disappears um because she was in another film that we did but but she wounds up his biggest claim uh ellen corby uh which is grandma walton in in the walton series so but she's uncredited she's not on on the thing but it's it's clearly her um yeah, she was in Shane. She was in Shane uh, as well. So you do see uh, uh, ones, uh, you know, reoccur. Uh, but uh, but yeah, no, it's just a a fabulous, fabulous uh, film. I, I really like it. I I am partial to sort of the old dark house uh, type films where it's a rainy night and they just it it really is perfect with this because you got flashing lightning and you got rain pouring down the windows you can't really see outside or when it is outside it's just black it's like black rain falling uh but uh, as i say the changes are quite different uh for all this uh you know uh dorothy mcguire is a bigger woman than uh helen is described in the book uh you know maybe not by a whole lot but uh uh she's i think uh, yeah she just she's not tiny and she, there's nothing mentioned about the red hair the funny part is that blanche the secretary rhonda fleming uh has red hair who who winds up to be you know big actress uh as well later uh but with uh you know a more in color film because you can see her red hair um and yeah, Dorothy McGuire, uh, I've always, I've always liked her acting. Um, and, and the, it's something that was interesting with the, uh, uh, commentator as well. She was saying that she's never really got the, uh, the, uh, the parts for, uh, you know, being a, 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 a sexy star. She always plays mothers and stuff, but I think that's a little, it, it's like, despite all that, she was a very uh, sexy ad actress. Uh, I won't go into anything more than that, but it's just, I think that's a little bit, the, she's not matronly, she's not, um, she, she's not, she's not put forward as a sex symbol, but there is a, a lot of sex appeal there uh, uh, for Dorothy McGuire. And I think that comes across easily on the screen. So that's, I was a little, you know, thought that was a bit strange comment. Um, uh, yeah, and, and just before this, uh, Dorothy McGuire did, she was the mother on, uh, Tree Grows in Brooklyn, which is another, uh, fabulous film. Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, well, it's an adaptation from Tree Grows in Brooklyn. I'm trying to remember the name. Smith, I think is the, Betty Smith, um, is the, uh, is the, um, author and i've got the film but i don't have the book but i do uh, i read the book many 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 years ago but i'd like to get it again and read it again uh, but it'll be a while before i can do that but yeah no this this keynote doesn't have a lot of extras on it uh it, there's no booklet with it uh it's got uh, the fabulous uh commentary it's also got the well it says 19 there's a typo on here it says 1945 screen directors 
uh, Playhouse radio broadcast of the Spiral Staircase. The date is wrong. It's actually 1949. Um, and I thought that was wrong, and I had to look it up. But, it, yeah, it's definitely 1949. Uh, there was an earlier one uh, that was done with uh, 1941. Helen Hayes actually did one that was from uh, the name of the of the book some must watch on her helen hayes theater i think it was it was a short-lived radio radio uh, uh, uh broadcast but um but yeah and, and the interesting thing is uh helen's character uh darth mcguire's character helen is mute on the radio as well and i'm thinking how are they going to do that because i don't know if i've ever listened to this one before um uh, like I knew about it, but I don't. Uh, but I I realized that I had heard it once. I I started listening to it, so they set up at the beginning clearly uh, how she and that she is mute, and then they take from the book her internal dialogue, her 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 speaking in her brain in her in her in her uh, uh, around scenes like saying you know oh make sure you smile for him so he knows that he's you know and she's saying stuff like that and she's asking questions in her brain. And the uh, Imogen's uh, Sarah Smith, the uh, commentator, says it doesn't work. On her. I think it works f fabulously, uh, and it's directed. The, the it's a half hour one, so it's really truncated um, as well. But it's I think it works quite well because you've got this internal dialogue of Dorothy McGuire. So she has a billion more lines than she does in the film, but it works because. Uh, while the two characters are talking, somebody else is talking, she talks as well at the same time in her head. And you can hear everything. It, 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 it's like it might have been strange for, for audiences, but I think it works extremely well because it's set up. She's saying, oh, well, how do you know what this is? Well, it's set up right at the beginning. You know that she's mute and you know that this is internal dialogue. Uh, and it's it works perfectly, and, and the the talking over a few times I thought was marvelous. I don't know if I don't know if I've ever come across that, and I've listened to thousands and thousands of hours of radio, uh, old time radio, and I don't remember I don't remember hearing that any other time. Uh, this this jumped out at me that it was that way, um, and that's the thing that I sort of like. Oh yes, I do remember that. Uh, but anyway, uh, so yeah, so but I, I, I can't remember the, uh, the Helen Hayes uh, um, 1941 uh, version of it um, that she plays Helen Capel. Uh, but it's probably, I think she's not mute in that as far as I know. And that could have been an hour long, uh, that one. So it might have been a little better. Um, but yeah, so I think that's it that I was going to say uh, for this. Uh, just a fabulous film. Um, if, if anybody wants... Uh, a fabulous read to begin with, and then a fabulous film noir, sort of southern gothic uh, uh, film, uh, gaslight uh, melodrama, or whatever you want to call it. It's just, it's absolutely fabulous film. Um, and as I say, but I'm, I'm biased because I am partial to, uh, I am partial to, uh, as I say, old dark house uh, uh, films. Um, like, you know, and, and even the ones that aren't the greatest, but this is this is a good one. And Robert C. Odmack is sort of the Dion, or Doyon, I guess, uh, Doyon? Okay. I'm not pronouncing that right, of uh, film noir. Um, and a lot for Universe, uh, RKO, and he did Republic, I believe, and a whole bunch of other. Uh, it just he he worked well within the studio. Like we he 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 worked with what he got uh, basically, and he and he did some marvelous things with it to get around sensors and and all sorts of things. But uh, next week is still up in the air. Uh, well, actually, I have four um, um, possibilities that I gave in my Friday reads yesterday. So do check that out. Uh, so far, leading is. Uh, this gun for hire. Uh, it's Graham Greene's gun for sale, um, and uh, that's that's the leading one so far. But if you're interested in this, go look at that and just listening. Uh, if you just want to skip to the end, that's fine, uh, and uh, just choose one of the uh, the films. I'll leave it up to probably about Wednesday before. Well, it's going to be there, but what I mean is I'll leave it because uh, and and uh, wh whichever book slash film wins 
uh, the most number of votes. Uh, I'll, I'll start reading it then, and that'll be next Saturday. So I think that'll be it. A um, little, little better this time for 35 minutes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a fabulous film, and I'm enjoying doing this, and I hope others are enjoying it as well. Um, I, I would like to say I, I'd like to take uh, some requests of what to do, which is, which is perfectly great. It's just uh, my budget at the moment is just zero, so it's, I'm working with what I got. Uh, at the moment um, so uh, and and so uh, I, I do apologize for that but it's I'm working with what I got and most of what I'm going to be doing is going to be classic film uh, pre-1960 basically pre-1970 for sure there, there'll be some other things that are newer uh, eventually I'll, I'll get to uh, but it's it's mostly things that I find interesting um, and that's where it is, but I, I'm definitely willing to, to hear people, uh, suggestions, uh, because it may not be something I thought of or even knew that there was a book, uh, as a basis for the film, um, you know, uh, but, uh, but so, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you're enjoying it and I hope you have a good week. I'll be back tomorrow with my second, uh, shelf tour of my transport books. Take care, book two.